Yeah, uh, welcome to my talk <laughs> and uh, all those on uh, on Zoom. I think I saw Karl Heinz Ernst there. Greetings, Carla. Nice to see you. And uh, I hope you haven't seen this talk before. If you have, just click away, <laughs> and I won't know the difference. But um, what I what I want to tell you about today is I thought, well, I'm coming to the Quantum uh, Nanoscience Center. I would tell you about the, the experiments that we have been doing, which show uh, the most significant quantum effects. And um, I don't know really if you uh, find it at all relevant to the research you're doing, but I find it very interesting because I've always found quantum mechanics very interesting. And um, it also follows maybe a bit in the style of the research here that you like to build very special instruments to do measurements that cannot be done elsewhere in the world with the idea that you will discover new things if you're able to do new kinds of measurements. I fully believe in this uh, approach to science and, and this was one of the inspiring aspects of this project. Um, and, and so in my talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit first about technology, SNSPDs, what are those? Single nanowire, sorry, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. Now you know why we call them SNSPDs because your tongue will get broken if you say the whole thing every time. So I wanna show you what those are, how they work and how you can use them. And then I wanna introduce you to a very special system here. Seems very boring, the CO molecule adsorbed to a sodium chloride 100 surface. And what, uh, what could be interesting about that? Actually, this turns out to be a very dense sample, a monolayer of CO on a sodium chloride turns out to be a very dense sample that is to a very close approximation, a gas phase sample of molecules, very weakly bound to the sodium chloride surface at very low temperature. And the CO molecules can interact with one another very strongly. And this leads to some rather unexpected uh, and interesting behavior that we've been able to study with this SNSPD technology. And I'll tell you about some phenomena we've looked at. One is the vibrational energy pooling, um, and another is then the vibrational relaxation. So the vibrational energy pooling, what happens essentially is you put some vibrational energy into this monolayer and the energy will pool into a small number of molecules and send them up to very high vibrational states. So you concentrate the energy into a small number of molecules. And then of course, somehow they relax down. So this turns out to be interesting to study. It turns out, of course, they also relax back down to the ground state. That turns out to be unexpectedly interesting. Um, and you won't be too surprised to find out that when you put a lot of energy into the molecule, it can do something that's kind of like chemistry. And in this case, the CO molecule, which is normally bound with its carbon atom to the floor, if you think of this as the sodium chloride down here, bound with its carbon atom to the floor, it can get flipped upside down. And we, we did discover that we could observe that. And that turned out in fact to be uh, a very unexpectedly interesting example of condensed phase tunneling in that this metastable upside down CO molecule also will thermally go back to the ground state. And um, we did some isotope studies of this and found some very peculiar behavior and have spent about two years trying to understand how that works. I, I'll try to tell you about that today too. So let me first tell you about light detectors based on superconductivity. And this is the result of uh, uh, collaboration that I started actually just at the very beginning when I came to Göttingen with an excellent group, the so-called faint photonics group at the, at the NIST laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, now led by uh, Rich Mirren and Se Wu Nam and Varun Verma, who's an expert in electrical engineer actually, in, in building these superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. And they've built all of our detectors and we've used them in our experiments. We've collaborated on this for about 10 years. So let me show you what these things are. Um, this is a, just a made from, uh, I think, electron beam lithography. Uh, you can see here, this is a superconducting na or a nanowire. Follow the purple line, you see it going back and forth. They call it a meandering nanowire. And it's quite small, 160 nanometers in size. And it's nothing more than, you know, it's the simplest electric component, electrical circuit you can have. You know, it's a conductor, right? It's a wire to put, to, to conduct. And it has special properties because when you cool it down, you can make it superconducting and uh, you can pass current through it. Oops, 
there. I'm going to push this one, pass current through it. And of course, it has zero resistance initially. And so, you know, if you if you measure the voltage across the wire initially, you know, you get zero voltage, and it looks like that. And then if if a photon hits it, um, it can be absorbed, and that will you know break up a lot of the, these so-called Cooper pairs, and and destroy the superconductivity in a spot that's on the same spatial size spatial order as 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 the size of the nanowire. And if you've set the superconducting uh, current to be, say, 50% of the critical current density. The critical current density is when you go above that, it will stop superconducting, it will break down, the superconductivity will break down. Then in this kind of situation, then, then the current goes around this hotspot and, and the critical current density is, is surpassed around the hotspot and you'll get the breakdown of the superconductivity all the way across the nanowire, at which point it starts to generate heat as a normal joule uh, heat from, from you know, an I, I times uh, V, uh, uh, you know, resistor. And, and you get a significant voltage because you put this in a, in a constant current circuit, then you get a big voltage drop. So here's a single photon on one of these uh, superconductors made with niobium nitride material where you see, you know, one photon gives you uh, you know, a, a big voltage. You can easily, you know, count that with counting electronics. Then it will cool back down within about 50 nanoseconds and, you know, you can do it again. And um, this one actually cools down in a few nanoseconds. So you can go to go to very, very high counting rates. These things typically have uh, timing jitters on the order of 50 picoseconds. They recover very rapidly. Detection efficiency is one to 10 hertz. Start count rates on the order of 100 counts per second. And you know a number of other uh, advantages. You can use them to detect high energy photons in the ultraviolet. But what's interesting, you can also also use them to detect low energy photons in the infrared. And that's where we got interested in them because they're actually quite good for infrared detection. Here's an example of some recent work out of Verne Verma's uh, laboratory where they're actually using not niobium nitride, they're using another actually far superior material called amorphous tungsten silicon. And this shows efficient single photon detection out to 16 microns where it really, really cuts off. And you can see here basically how these things work. Um, if you imagine here that, that you, know, you set the bias current going through this nanowire at say something like 1.3 microns, right? Then you, you can, or 1.3 microamperes, then you can see you know, as you scan this, if you have a high energy photon at 4.8 microns, as you scan up the bias current, you see you get more uh, uh, detectivity until you flatten out, right? And here's basically where you're getting a pulse for every single infrared photon that's absorbed by the nanowire. And, and this even works, you know, close to saturation level out to a, a, a 10 micron uh, photon. So this is, this is wonderful uh, for, uh, uh, for molecular science because infrared spectroscopy is, is so useful for understanding, you know, problems in, in in molecular science. I also wanted to say recently they built kilopixel arrays of these so that, that sort of the camera version of this technology is, is quickly being developed. Um, just a word about the difference between the, this sort of the original material that was used for these superconducting nanowires, niobium nitride. The amorphous tungsten silicide has a number of advantages, one of, those, one of which is niobium nitride is a crystalline, is a crystalline material. So it's a nanowire is a polycrystalline material. Consequently, you have crystalline grain boundaries, which lead to manufacturing defects and, and uh, you know, failed nanowire fabrication, essentially. The amorphous tungsten silicon is, in fact, a glass, so it's impossible for it to have crystalline grain boundaries, right? And it actually has some other properties um, which make the hot spot created by a single photon absorption actually much larger. Um, this has to do with the superconducting properties of this material, and as a consequence, you don't have to make them as, as narrow in order to get a, a very strong uh, response. It, it does have uh, the downside that you need cryogenics that cool this thing significantly below one Kelvin, whereas the niobium nitride will work at, at even uh, about three Kelvin. So what, what can you do with this sort of detector? Let me just show you uh, the first slide of this, this CO sodium chloride system that I wanna, that I wanna introduce. Um, 
well, here's, you will notice a 100 salt crystal. It's easy to cleave in situ in the vacuum chamber, and you can absorb uh, CO onto this surface. Below 20 Kelvin, it, about 20 Kelvin, it will stick, and we, we cool it down. Typically, we're doing these experiments about 7 Kelvin. This has been studied for a long time, uh, actually, by George Ewing at the University of Indiana many years ago. Infrared spectroscopy has shown that you get this two-by-one structure, sort of what you can think of this sort of as a dimer-like molecule on the surface, which actually has an, an anti-symmetric CO stretch and a, and a symmetric CO stretch, um, which are split from one another. And as a, as a consequence, you see actually two features in the, in the infrared absorption spectrum here. These are both essentially CO stretch vibrations. They're strongly polarization dependent. So if you, if you change the infrared, this is just an FDI or absorbance spectrum, you change the polarization of the FDIR from P to S, you get you know, different intensities. And what I only want to show you here is that if you now take an infrared laser and scan over these absorptions of the molecule and use these SNSPDs to look at the fluorescence that comes out of the system, you can get a spectrum which is essentially identical, right? This is, this is just detecting the absorption of the CO monolayer by its infrared emission using these SNSPD detectors. So this is a way to do mid-infrared laser-induced fluorescence of molecules on surfaces. Now let me show you. Yeah, sure. There are some that are commercially available. That's right. And uh, the niobium nitride uh, nanowires are commercially available, and um, the amorphous tungsten silicon are available from the NIST lab. Actually, uh, many people don't realize this, but the U.S. NIST lab, many of their uh, purposes are actually to encourage dissemination of certain technologies into the scientific community. So if you're interested in, in this sort of technology, I could put you in touch with Rich and, and Varun back in Boulder. I'm sure they'd be very interested to talk to you about potentially using their, uh, their nanowires in, in your experiment if you have some idea what to do with them. So let me tell you, first of all, a little bit about vibrational en energy pooling and how that happens. Via, via base camp. So I, I showed you there was a laser induced fluorescence spectrum. You could scan the laser and see the fluorescence come out. Let me show you what the fluorescence spectrum looks like. Um, when you excite the molecule you know, on the, one of these CO stretches, and now you scan the spectrometer that's detecting the infrared fluorescence coming from the sample, um, this is the kind of spectrum that you get. Now, of course, this is, this is averaged over all the time that the light comes out, is, comes out over a period of about a millisecond. And this spectrum is actually very easy to assign, even, even though you know, it may look, well, it looks pretty simple, right? Essentially, each one of these emission features is CO in, in a vibrationally excited state. And, and you can assign, you know, we know where these frequencies are, so we can really assign these quite easily. We can do isotope studies to make the assignment more secure and so forth. But essentially what you're seeing here is that there's, you know, something like V equals five, six, seven, it goes all the way on up to about, you know, close to V equals 30. And there's some funny uh, intensity pattern that you see here, which I'm going to uh, show you has to do with what we call the base camp mechanism. If, if you ever went mountain climbing to very high mountains, you know what you do is you go very rapidly up to the first base camp, then you rest, and then you go very you know, slower up to the second base camp, and then you rest, and then you go even slower up to the summit, right? And this is really what's happening in this pooling process. You go very quickly up to about V equals seven, you go more slowly up to V equals 14 or so, and then you go very slowly up to V equals uh, 20 something. And, and then you begin to cascade back down. So that's why we call this, this, this base camp mechanism. Okay, so what's going on here? It's actually uh, very, very simple. You come with the intense infrared laser and you pump the molecules. Almost all of them will be pumped up to the V equal one state on the surface. And then they're densely packed next to one another. So there's strong dipole-dipole interactions between the molecules and they begin to exchange energy. And they can do things like what's shown here. Oops, there we go. Things like shown here, you can have two molecules of V equals one produce one molecule V equals two, one V equals zero. And this is actually because these are anharmonic oscillators, a little bit exoergic, right? It will release a little bit of energy into the phonons of, of the system and, and that will disappear into, into, the, uh, into, into thermal energy and not come back essentially, right? And once you, once you get to V equals two, 
this can happen again. You get two plus one goes to three plus zero, and it's even more exoergic. And this energy disappears into the phonons of the solid. And then V equals three can pick up another quantum, make four. It's even more exoergic. And this just keeps getting better, right? Because the energy really cannot go back into the molecule, becomes more and more exoergic. Actually, the processes become significantly faster um, until you sort of don't have any more phonons at, at high enough energy. You can see, you know, when I get up maybe to V equals six or seven, I'm going to be beyond the Debye frequency of the solid, and there's no single phonon that can accept the energy, and therefore you kind of will hit a ceiling, right? So, you know, early studies of this kind of process thought, you know, zoom up to V equals seven, you know, that's sort of the end of the story. So you hit a ceiling about V equals nine, but we see obviously much higher vibrational states than that. So I, I put together a little animation uh, which shows results of um, uh, a kinetic Monte Carlo study uh, that we did on this that, that reveals sort of how you get these, these high vibrational states. And, 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 and I think this gives a very nice pictorial view of how this works. So just imagine you're looking down onto a sodium chloride lattice. Everywhere here, you see a zero, that's a CO at V equals zero, sitting on top of a sodium ion in the sodium chloride lattice, all right? And now we're gonna pump it with a laser. It goes you know, to first approximation, they all go into V equal one. And there's all these dipole-dipole couplings going on between the molecules, right? Now, let me just change this animation slightly. So each one of these vibrational quanta, I'm gonna just represent as, you know, a gold brick, you know, just a, a, an energy quanta. And then if you have this pooling, you, have th you just have processes that look like this. One plus one goes to two plus zero is nothing more than exchange of energy between two neighbors, right? And, and now one of those sites has no, there's still, the CO molecules didn't move, right? It's only the energy that moves. And that, so there's one CO molecule that now has no excitation. And, and now you can have the two plus one goes to three plus zero. So you can see the energy just being pooled into, you know, one of these molecules. And notice every time we go up the ladder, we're, we're a more exoergic process giving a larger, you know, creating a higher energy phonon in, in the solid. And this, this could keep going now four plus one goes to five plus zero releases now 96 wave numbers of energy. And um, here's actually sort of a less than obvious thing is, is that, you know, the quanta can actually move around, right? So, uh, so, so it, if you don't have a neighbor, you can have a near resident one plus zero goes to a zero plus one, that's energy resident happens very, very efficiently. But you'll notice here, you get up to something like V equals eight or V equals nine. And this is very close to the Debye energy of, of the crystal. And so you kind of will, will stop, right? And, and this, this site will now not be able to go much higher, but elsewhere on the surface of the CO, then you'll, be, you'll, you'll build up these clusters uh, like you see here, right? So af after some period, then you'll end up with a surface that looks kind of like this, right? You have all these molecules sort of nine quanta pooled molecules, but they're now on average, you know, quite a bit further away from one another than, you know, the lattice spacing, you know? And so this now dipole, you have dipole-dipole coupling between these and, and then you can exchange dipoles and have this one say pooled, all of these outer ones may pool to this inner one. And, and then you again can give energy, uh, you know, these are, these are low, low uh, you know, nearly isoenergetic. So they're releasing low energy phonons into the solid. And then this can happen, you know, sequentially over and over until, you know, you hit another ceiling eventually. So this will just keep on going like this until, you know, you get to maybe V equals 14 or 15. And then, uh, you know, you, you again hit this ceiling. And all these things will sort of, you know, collect into now new clusters like this that are now even further away. And so on a much slower time scale, you'll then begin to see these V to V energy transfer uh, across these clusters. And, and you can actually sort of see all this stuff in, in the infrared laser induced fluorescence study that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so let, let me just show you uh, a little bit what we did in terms of modeling. This shows uh, results from a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, just using these dipolar interactions. And also uh, the rates are then, you know, related to the phonon density of states, which obviously cuts off. 
And in this kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, you only let the nearest neighbors, these, the, the, black one, the black dot in the middle is where the energy is pooling and the red around them are where you know, V to V energy transfer is allowed. And then you can also have the V to V energy diffusion, so to speak. But this only allows you then to get up to this first, uh, uh, this, this first you know, what we call a base camp here. And then when you allow the energy transfer to happen out to about um, eight, uh, eight angstrom or, or, or 80 angstroms uh, radius dif distance, then you can begin with a kinetic Monte Carlo scheme, uh, show that you could get all the way up to these high vibrational states. And, and this funny shape in the curve also has to do with the fact that there's kind of a selectivity in which surface phonons are most efficient at, at accepting the energy out of the, out of the pooling process. That, that's shown here, actually. If, if, if you look at different models of the phonon density of states, um, you can take a simple the by picture of the phonon density of states, and, and, and using this kinetic Monte Carlo scheme, you can get a vibrational state distribution that looks like this. It sort of looks like the experiment, but you know, not quite. Um, you can also use the ab initio uh, methods like density functional theory to calculate the, the true surface phonon density of states. And Jörg Meyer, the University of Leiden, helped us with this project and did, did these kind of calculations. And if you, if you assume that you know, the project, projected, the full projected density of states is here, this blue curve here, um, if you assume that th that's the density of states that matter, then you, see, you get something, you know, again, looks sort of like the data, but not quite. And if you assume these long, only the longitudinal uh, phonons, the ones that are vibrating normal to the surface, essentially, um, they, they uh, are, are, are selectively participating. And they also get something kind of looks like the data. But when you take these transverse phonons, the phonons that are parallel, uh, vibrating parallel to the surface, um, you actually get something that looks remarkably like what you see in experiments. So we, we consider this you know, pretty strong evidence that there's a selective uh, accept, you know, there, there's phonons that more efficiently accept the energy uh, into the, into the, uh, you know, the, the, these transverse phonons accept the energy more efficiently. Okay, so that's kind of the first story I want to tell you is, is this, this vibrational energy pooling and how it happens through this base cap method and that even though the system is at, you know, a few Kelvin with one laser pulse, you can really put you know, many electron volts of energy into these molecules. They don't desorb from the surface. Um, they radiate light. Um, they do some other things too, which I'll show you in a minute, but they also relax. And I wanna talk for a moment about how they vibrationally relax. Um, and and these, these show again, some, some experimental observations. What, what are we doing here? Essentially, all we do is we tune the monochromator to look at a specific emission line. Here's, here's V equals five. At a certain wavelength, and we measure the time dependence with this, this you know very high time resolution SNSPD detector, and you know you don't see anything too stunning here. You basically see what looks like you know a first order exponential decay, and as you go higher and higher up the vibrational ladder, it gets faster and faster and faster. Okay, there's some kind of sloping here at the beginning. This is because these are not single, these are not two level systems, right? This is creating some population distribution, which then relaxes by cascading down this ladder system. And so the, you know, the V equals five is being filled here by higher vibrational states. And eventually there's not much above it and it's just, it's decaying away. So you have to, you know, you have, if you really want to analyze this carefully, you know, you have to be, do some pretty sophisticated um, kinetics analysis, which I'll, I'll show you. That's what this kinetic Monte Carlo helps you do. But just, just for a moment, let's just take the the empirical effective uh, uh, first order rate constants, and, and they look like this, right? So, so they go up with a uh, vibrational quantum number, you know, relatively rapidly like this, okay? From spanning about two orders of magnitude as you go from, you know, the, the lowest Vs to the highest Vs. Okay, but now let me show you how we're, how we're gonna model that, okay? So there's, there's pretty much, there's sort of two, two models that exist in the literature which are, which are plausible. And actually when I started this, I thought this was the most plausible because this is similar to the problem of um, intramolecular vibrational randomization that happens in highly energetic polyatomic molecules. And if you think about CO on a sodium chloride surface, you might easily imagine that 
we could think of this as a polyatomic molecule, right? And we put a lot of energy into the CO stretch. And we asked the question, how does the energy dissipate into the rest of the molecule? And the, the way, the, what the field of IVR has taught us over the years is this has, has to do with the anharmonicity of the potential energy surface. So if, if, this, if this potential energy surface were, were perfectly harmonic, that every vibrational degree of freedom here were harmonic, you put energy into one degree of freedom, it will stay there, okay? But if there's anharmonicity coupling the different degrees of freedom, the energy will flow through the system. And this is uh, in the literature been uh, proposed to explain this system uh, you know, all the way back in 2002, and it goes under the name of Skinner-Tully model. It was developed by uh, Skinner and Tully, and this is, you know, sort of what seemed most reasonable. However, there's another uh, model that, that was proposed, which is very strange, I thought, very strange, okay? And um, it actually goes back to uh, the work of Arnold Sommerfeld. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what Arnold Sommerfeld was interested in. And uh, he was interested in radio communication. And in fact, if you want to send a radio signal from here, say to Taipei, you know, the, the earth is curved. How does it get there? Right. And you can easily imagine that, that the way it works is you bounce radio waves off the ionosphere where you have, you know, sort of a charged surface. And, and so you could have some radio wave reflectivity and you'd get your radio signal, you know, around the curve of the earth. And this is in fact, one way you can, do radio uh, transmission, it works. Um, and, but there's another way. And that's because uh, radio waves set up what are called surface waves. And so when you, when you, when you create a, a radio antenna on the surface of the earth, you will actually have a surface wave that goes out and follows the surface of the earth. And the amplitude drops due to the absorption of the energy by the earth's surface based on whatever the earth is made up of. It reflects from objects on the surface, obviously, but you can actually transmit radio waves a relatively long distance um, by this surface wave phenomenon. And so Arnold Sommerfeld was one of the first to, to work this out all the way back in 1909 and, and you know, established all the equations for how to, how to do this, obviously classical uh, electrodynamics and, and you know, this is not quantum mechanics, but in a few years after that, 1974, uh, Chance, Parak, and, and Bob Silby figured out the quantum mechanical version of this that you could do with very tiny particles. And it's qualitatively very similar. If you think of a CO molecule on a surface, it will radiate a surface wave to the left and to the right in all, all directions. And this radio wave will be absorbed by, or this, this, this surface wave will be absorbed by the surface, essentially given by the complex index of refraction of, of the surface material, which for sodium chloride is very, very weak. Um, and so this leads to you know, pretty long lifetimes. It also leads to very different predictions about how the vibrational relaxation depends on the vibrational quantum number, because you can imagine one is based on you know, force and harmonicities, and the other one is based on essentially you know, electromagnetic properties. So, so what you see in, in the predictions of these of these models is Skinner Tully model tells you that you know over the vibrational quanta seen in this experiment from you know v equals five to v equals 20 you should change the rate constant by some you know five to six orders of magnitude and what's quite interesting is that that's not what we see um, rather we see here something that looks kind of like this changing by one to two orders of magnitude and just, just so you can really appreciate the difference here, here's just the gas phase radiative lifetime of CO molecules in different vibrational states, the isolated molecule, right? Just it's, it's spontaneous emission in the infrared. And, and we know how this looks uh, very accurately because we, we know everything you could possibly want to know about the CO molecule. And, and this, this CPS model predicts something that's faster because there is coupling uh, you know, to the solid, but, you know, essentially has, has the same kind of shape. And so we decided to call this prediction um, the Sommerfeld ground wave limit for vibrational relaxation, because this is essentially the most inefficient relaxation process you can have for a molecule on the surface. <clears throat> so here's these uh, measurements that I showed you before about how the vibrational relaxation lifetime depends on the vi vibrational quantum number. 
And here are the, the when, we, when we put in all those state-specific rate constants into our kinetic Monte Carlo uh, 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 simulation, um, we get these, uh, these solid circles here when we use this uh, ground wave model. And we get these, these, these squares when we use the Skinner-Tully model. So it's quite, it's quite clear that this uh, CPS model agrees much better with the data out to about V equals 20. And then there's some kind of deviation here, uh, which you know, could very well be here where here at these very high vibrationally excited states, the anharmonicity of the potential really does start to play a role in this kind of sub switch over from the CPS model to the, to the Skinner-Tully model. Okay, so that's the sort of the second little story I wanted to tell you here about the CO sodium chloride system, what kind of interesting behavior it exhibits. Yes, yes. This is this is a pulse measurement, right? So yeah, I didn't I didn't really uh, explain that very well, but yeah. So we we have a pulse, a nanosecond pulse laser. Then the pooling happens. We can I didn't show you any time resolved data, but we can see the time resolved uh, uh, appearance of different vibrational states and see that you know first base gap is fast, second base gap is slower, third base gap. Is even slower. So, so basically, on these time scales, the pooling is all happening instantaneously, right? And then the, this is all then the relaxation going back down. And and so we're using this kinetic Monte Carlo to simulate the up pumping and these uh, uh, either CPS or or or, or uh, Skinner Tully rate constants to simulate the cascading back down to the ground state. And and that's that's what these these Closed circles are that simulation that we've used when we assume this CPS model. In other words, it's very weak dependence on the vibrational quantum number on how fast it can relax, and so it, it you know, shows the, the, the you know, reproduces the, data, the observed rate constants. These are these effective, these like the effective lifetimes one over the rate constant. Um, so, that, so these these open circles, these are experimental observables, like like shown from the, you know, gained from these kinetic plots. And if we use this Skinner-Tully model based on anharmonicity, you can just see that the vibrational state dependence is far too strong. We, we can't really uh, rationalize that, except you know, over here, there, it does seem to be going into another regime where it's much more strongly depending on, on the vibrational quantum. So possibly there's, what, what we're saying is possibly here's, this is the, you know, the, the Sommerfeld ground wave uh, limit here. And then here then the anharmonicity really is starting to kick in because you know, as the higher up, vibrational, as you get higher and higher vibrational amplitude, the anharmonicity will start to become a more important factor. But I, that's just probably my own experience. I always have in my head that vibrational amplitude is going to be the same scale. Yeah, this is the, this is the summer full Feld ground wave limit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right, so it's more of a general Yeah. Well, one thing, it's an insulator, right? So we don't have electron hole pair coupling. Uh, on a metal, you get picoseconds because you have vibrational coupling to electron hole pairs of the metal. This is an insulator, so you don't have that. Um, the phonons are far out of resonance with, with the CO stretch. And, and indeed, the, as I tried to say just at the beginning, I think this is probably the best evidence of it. These are really almost like gas phase molecules weakly bound to the solid and interacting with one another. And they, they give up their energy to the solid, but almost at, almost because you know they're suspended over the solid and, and they can't avoid the interaction with the solid, but it's not because they have you know chemical bonds to the solid, like something like hydrogen atoms on silicon with a strong covalent bond would show all these anharmonicity effects. And I think lifetimes on those systems are measured to be nanoseconds or something like that. They're slower than metals, but yeah, they're still you know many orders of magnitude faster than this. So this is this is a very un you know, it's a really different kind of behavior. And, and that's what I find uh, particularly interesting about it. Look at Carl Heinz Aaron says, raised his hand. Can he, yeah. can he, can we let Carla ask a question? Yeah, I have a question. Ah. Uh, concerning about this pooling, I mean, vibrational pooling, I understand that, but you also uh, explained it by uh, a clustering of the molecules. Clustering of the energy. Those gold bars are energy. The molecules don't cluster. So that the molecules are not moving to each other closer. That's right. There's just the quanta are being exchanged between the molecules. The gold bricks 
represent the, the vibrational quanta. Okay, okay. Then it's clear to me. So I was wondering okay. if, they, if there's an extra intermolecular force pulling them together. No, no, the, the CO molecule stays stuck on a given lattice site throughout all of this stuff. But the dipole, dipole interaction should be stronger as well if I excite the vibration, right? Dipole dipole interactions are extraordinarily strong because the molecules are also so close to one another on the on the lattice of the sodium chloride surface. Okay, thanks. My pleasure. <laughs> okay, so you won't be too too shocked then to learn that when you see all these highly vibrationally excited molecules, uh, that you know strange things might happen. That uh, besides just coming back down to the ground state. And so I want to tell you now about the upside down CO molecule. And this shows actually the same uh, laser-induced fluorescence emission spectrum that I showed you before. However, we improved the machine and, and put a better grading into uh, the infrared spectrometer. And we discovered, lo and behold, there aren't just one set of lines in there. There are two sets of lines. And we thought, OK, what do we have? What's going on here? Do we have some impurity in the system? Don't have any impurity. Do we have some isotopes? No, we got isotopically pure samples. And at some point we realized the only possible thing you can have is you have two different kinds of CO molecules on the surface. So you can have a CO molecule bound with its carbon atom to the sodium, which is assumed to be, the, was previously the only known structure of CO on a sodium chloride surface. Um, but you can also have the, uh, uh, the, the uh, metastable state where the molecule is essentially upside down on the surface. And you can actually match these. If you make such an assignment, you can uh, map out uh, the vibrational assignment here and derive uh, the harmonic frequency and the anharmonic uh, contribution to, to, the, to the vibrational energy uh, for both this right side up CO and this upside down CO. And what you find out is when you compare it to the gas phase CO molecule, this one is blue shifted and this one is red shifted. And in fact, just by taking into account uh, the interaction of an oscillating dipole with a sodium chloride, the electrostatic interactions between an oscillating dipole and, and this charged lattice, you can actually easily explain why one should be blue shifted, one should be red shifted. In fact, you can explain that quantitatively, and this shows uh, calculations done by Yasha Lau as part of his uh, uh, PhD thesis, and he used what's called a vibrationally adiabatic electrostatic model. So if you take each vibrational state, actually from the gas phase, you know all these numbers. This is all worked out for CO. The, the dipole moment of V equals zero up to about V equals 30 is simply known, okay? And likewise, the quadrupole moment of each vibrational state is known, and the octopole moment is even known. So you can put a molecule in a given vibrational state and know its entire electrostatics, and you can bring it up to the sodium chloride surface and ask, you know, how does its energy level get shifted because it's next to this? And it will be, of course, shifted vibrationally state specifically. And uh, what, what Yasha showed was that this is sort of like a, a you know, this is showing the geometry in, in this region here. You're, you're looking at the C down molecule. You get a blue shift and he could calculate the magnitude of the blue shift. And in this region where the molecule is upside down, you get a red shift. This is the same, it's just because of symmetry reasons, these are the same structures here, here, and here. You get a you get a red shift. Here shows the electrostatic energy of the system. Here's the deepest structure is the C down, and there's a barrier and a, and a well here, a, a higher energy metastable well. Here's a here's a cut through this thing. And this is the C down CO and the O down CO. And just from the electrostatic interactions, you can you can you know, show that the, this, this structure is reasonable. And you can calculate the red shift and the blue shift. So, no, no, these are pure electrostatics. So these are based on, these are based on a, a model that considers the gas phase CO molecule and all the experimental data that's known for these electrostatics of the gas phase CO molecule, and then let that interact with a, a, a charge array, uh, which was a sodium chloride surface. We also include CO-CO uh, -CO dispersion interactions in this. So the simple picture is that you make this vibrationally excited molecule and it starts out as you know, 
the, in, the, in the ground state CO molecule, carbon is partially negatively charged. The oxygen is partially positively charged. When you go up to some higher vibrational state, this dipole moment shifts, also the quadrupole moment and the octopole moment changes. But here, the idea is that it just flips around because in the highly vibrationally excited state, you know, it's more wants to be, you know, the electrostatics cause it to flip and then it will vibrationally relax down and get stuck in this metastable well. What we also found was on this, this uh, CO model here that there, we couldn't find direct evidence of this O bound. It was, it was obviously uh, back converting to the ground state CO relatively quickly. We could see these emission features on the millisecond time scale, but if we then wheeled the sample under the FTIR after a minute, you know, it was certainly gone, probably gone much faster than that. But using this electrostatic model, we could go one, one step further because we found that we could make the CO molecule buried on the, or the CO molecule adsorbed onto the, onto the sodium chloride surface, and then we could add more CO molecules on top to make a buried model layer. And the buried model layer then turns out is much longer lived. It won't flip back to the upside down, to the right side up molecule very rapidly. And uh, what you see here is a, a kind of a laser pumping experiment. Here's the initial sample that you start with, with this uh, split doublet of CO stretches because of this two by one monolayer structure at the surface. But now you've got a, an overlayer on top of it and you've pumped the, pump it with a laser for a while. And you see this feature, this absorption feature drops. These, the red and black are just two different polarizations in the FTIR. Both of these drop and you get this new feature coming up over here. And if you then heat the thing up to about 20 Kelvin or so, you watch it disappear again and this one comes back. So you really are creating this uh, metastable uh, form of CO on the surface that, that converts back to the original, the original state. And furthermore, this, this electrostatic model I just showed you, this blue and red predicts the shift from the gas phase molecule. So it really, really sort of all holds together. Okay, now I want to uh, show you uh, perhaps the most peculiar and, and fascinating observations that, that came out of this work. I think that's already, if this had been the last thing CO and sodium chloride had, been, had, had to tell us, I would have been fully satisfied. But this seems to be the system that just keeps on giving. Um, and so we started to look at the thermal uh, relaxation back conversion of this upside down CO molecule on the uh, 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 on the in the buried model layer. That, that we could actually see in the FTIR that we could heat it to a finite temperature and watch it relax back, measure the rate. And we thought we'd just do some kinetics on this. Now let me just, before I get into this, let me tell you what I knew about tunneling when we started this project. And I, may, maybe you know more about tunneling than this, but this is about what I knew at the time. My thought about tunneling was you had a wave that hits a, hits a barrier. The energy of the wave or the wave particle is lower than the barrier height. And so you get a reflected wave um, and you could also get some transmission, which we call tunneling. So you could have a matter wave that tunnels through a barrier. And the reason that happens is that, you know, the de Broglie wavelength is on the order of the barrier width. And so this thing just doesn't die off all the way to zero by the time you get to the other side and, and you get this, right? And, and if you do calculations on a very simple system like that, you, you of course know that uh, there is some finite probability for molecules to tunnel through the barrier, even though they don't really have enough energy to get through. <clears throat> and we know how this should depend on mass. Uh, if, you, if you look at a particle of mass m, you'll get a transmission function that looks like this is a function of energy. Um, and if you double the mass, you get a transmission function that looks something like this. And this is, oh, sorry, I'll go back here. And, and this, of course, tells you what, you know, the, the intuitive result is that the higher the mass, the less important quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical tunneling should be. <clears throat> well, we looked in the literature, actually this came very near the end of, of our analysis, we found this paper and we realized that there was some peculiar things in the literature. Um, this is a, a paper, from the group of Hans Frauenfelder on a much more complicated system. He was lo looking, he was very interested, he's a biophysics specialist and he was very interested in myoglobin. And he put different isotopes of CO on myoglobin. And 
he used a laser to, to photo dissociate them to separate the CO and watched how fast they come back to the ground state. So in many ways, similar to what we're doing with this metastable upside down CO molecule. And, and he interpreted his results as due to tunneling uh, back to the ground state. And, and the interesting thing here is he looked at different isotopes and, and surprisingly, he saw here that the light isotope was not necessarily the fastest tunnel. Okay, so this is as far as I know, the first time this was ever reported in the literature that you would have a light isotope tunnel slower than a heavy isotope. Well, there was no real clear explanation of this. If, if you notice this data, this is no Arrhenius plot. It's some complex kinetics. Um, I, I believe the interpretation is correct, although I'm not so how, not sure how he could be so sure at the time, but um, seems to be. So we set about doing similar measurements on this much simpler system, where we then just put the C13O18 against the sodium chloride, cover it up by C12O16. You'll notice the 2638 notation sort of indicates the isotopes, and we'd pump it for a while until we got this upside down CO molecule. And then we look as a function of temperature, how rapidly it comes back down to the ground state. And this is the kind of data that we got. First of all, they're exponentially decaying from the upside down to the right side up. And if you look here, you know, blue, in, increasing mass is blue, gray, red, black. So here you see blue, gray, red, black. It's just not light to heavy, all right? And this is not a, a, an artifact. We've, we've looked at this so extensively that we're sure uh, that you know, this, is, this is really how, how, it, how it comes out. And um, uh, we're also sure this is tunneling. I'll give you some more evidence in a minute. But here's, here's the total set of data that we took for you know, four isotopes um, and one, two, one isotope repeated you know, two months apart. So it's a measure of the reproducibility of the data, if you look at the, the open circles and the triangles, right, they basically line up pretty well. Uh, so there's, there's, first of all, to notice here, there's a very large isotope effect, right? Here down at about 19 Kelvin, the isotope effect's about a factor of five. And there's actually only one uh, example of, of any kinetic process in the literature on similarly heavy atoms that showed such a large isotope effect. That's, uh, Andreas, your work on the, the CO domino cascading on, on the, I believe that was on the copper surface. Okay, so how do we understand this? Uh, we, we first of all sort of look at the data and try to find out what kind of systematics there might be. And, and we find out, you know, it's not really scaling as mass. Um, so also we notice these pre-factors are extraordinarily small. Um, the, just for reference, the transition state theory predicted uh, uh, prefactors are on the order of 10 to the 12th or higher. Some of, some of our prefactors are, are smaller than 10 to the 9th. And um, what we also notice is, although the mass does not give you any clear uh, you know, systematics, what you see here is as the, as the observed activation energy increases, so does the prefactor. Okay, so there's just an empirical observation here that the prefactors and the activation energies correlate with one another. That's just that's just an observation from the results. Here, here you can see this a little a little bit more clearly. You know, mass 29, 28, 30, these things don't line up in order of mass, but they are systematic in terms of you know, the higher the activation energy, the higher the prefactor. And a couple of things to notice here are that when you see such, uh, such small prefactors, this is first of all a sign of tunneling because it's two to three orders of magnitude smaller than the over the barrier transition state rate. And that's because you know, the tunneling through the barrier you know, attenuates uh, the reactivity essentially. Okay. So we have this correlation of active energies and prefactors. Uh, wait a minute. I think I, wanna, I think I missed something. I, I want to point point one more thing out here. Here's here's the transition state theory predictions with all four isotopes in here. Okay, so there's there's essentially no isotope effect predicted from transition state theory. Whereas here you see you vary the isotopes, you get very large uh, changes in 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 the prefactors and activation energies. So we came up with this idea 
So, so essentially the idea is that how, how can we possibly explain this correlation? And the, and the idea we had was that you could, you know, if you start here in this upside down CO molecule and you have thermal population of some excited vibrational state that can somehow sp specially tunnel through. And the idea is here, there's a resonant enhanced tunneling. It's not a continuum tunneling model. It's a, it's a resonance tunneling model. But if there were some state here that acted like a gateway through the tunnel or through the barrier, then you might very well expect that when you change from one isotope to another, if you found a gateway that was higher in energy, its probability to be transmitted through the barrier would in fact also be higher. Okay, so because you're closer to the top of the barrier. And so this gave us this, this idea of um, tunneling gateways and that, that this is a, a, thermally, uh, a thermally activated process where you thermally populate a vibrationally excited state. Therefore, you get this Arrhenius-like behavior, but the, the tunneling probability is reflected in the prefactor. And, and therefore, if the energy of the gateway is reflected in the activation energy, and the higher the energy of the gateway, then the, the, the barrier is narrower and, and you can tunnel more rapidly through as so you get a higher prefactor. And that was just sort of our experimentalist's intuition. This looks like this is the only thing we can think of that makes sense, right? And, and at that point, we uh, took up uh, our cause with uh, Peter Salkrank in Potsdam and his student, uh, Shreya Sinha, uh, who in the meantime has defended her PhD and they constructed a more sophisticated uh, theoretical model with this physics built in, right? So instead of just relying on your own imagination, let's do some real calculations. And they came up with a Fermi Golden Rule scheme where, well, I'll just remind you how Fermi's Golden Rule works. You need to have some system wave functions. So these will be these vibrationally these vibrational states of the CO molecule, say CO bending states and CO translation states against the surface. And we need to calculate those wave functions for, for that system state. And then we'll treat uh, the, the, the phonons of the system as a bath. And, and so the idea is basically, we'll get some population of some excited states and we'll have essentially collisions with the sodium chloride solid that it will transfer phonons back and forth and pop us from one vibrational state to another. And this could induce a transition across, uh, across the barrier. So here's your, Fermi golden rule, uh, uh, you know, matrix elements, this gives you, gives you the rate constant. And here's, you have to come up with a system bath coupling Hamiltonian to describe how the, the phonons couple to the system. And this is taken in very simple ways. Basically this coupling strength is proportional to the phonon density of states. And, and here's, here's the form of, of the coupling. Here is Z is, is this, we, we take a two dimensional system where we just let the CO molecule move, translate normal to the surface and, and rotate against the surface. <clears throat> so here's what the, the potential energy surface can be calculated then using density functional theory. Here's the, here's the C down CO molecule. Here's the O down uh, metastable state. Here's, here's the barrier in between. And this was done in a number of different uh, conditions to, to see you know, how robust is, is this picture. And then the system states are calculated. It's actually one of the one of the places where Peter's group really excels is to make very high precision calculations of the wave functions up to quite high vibrational states um, in this system. And you can you know here's just some examples of what some of these states look like. And these are the ground state C down molecule with a couple of quanta of rotation and many quanta of translation against the surface. Here's some O down structures where you have one quantum of, of translational excitation and three quanta of rotational excitation. And if you calculate how many states there are, there's actually an awful lot of these, right? And they also depend on the isotopes. And so he did all the calculations for all four isotopomers on, on one potential surface to try to look, you know, what, what, what the results would look like. Okay, here's, here's the density of states that was used for, for coupling the system to the bath. And I don't want to say he got agreement with experiment, okay? Because there's no way you can really get quantitative agreement with experiment on some kind of tunneling problem where the potential comes from density functional theory and is guaranteed to be off by a hundred wave numbers minimum, right? There's no way you get absolute rates of tunneling, but let's just see what he did get, okay? So 
what, what Shreya and Peter got out of their, their result was a strong correlation between the pre-factor and the activation energy in their thermally activated tunneling. And we also did calculations using uh, the standard tunneling models, WKB tunneling, instanton tunneling, all four isotopes lie under this symbol. All four isotopes lie under this symbol. So there's, this is the only theory that we, that we have that can explain this uh, result. And it's, again, because of the fact that in, in this uh, uh, Fermi Golden Rule picture, there are these resonance effects that you, you get a vibrationally excited O down molecule that some, somehow accidentally is resonant with a state on the other side of the barrier. And there's some kind of wave function overlap and this enhances the transmission uh, through the barrier and, and, you, and you actually can get these kind of results. <clears throat> and here's a, a, a little bit more detailed results from, from the model just to show, again, not that there's quantitative agreement with the experiment, but there's a qualitative effect that the, the heaviest isotope actually is, is faster than, than the lighter isotopes. So this really can come out of this model that heavier molecules could tunnel faster the lighter molecules, because there's a resonance enhancement to the tunneling that you don't find in a WKB picture or, or an instanton picture. Um, the, the theory also then allows you to look at what some of these gateway states look like. And so here's a thermally populated gateway in the C13018. And this shows then the, the C down state that's accepting uh, the vibrational energy or, or basically it's it's being populated by these weak collisions with the phonon bath. Here's, here's the, initial, the initial state over here. Oops. The initial state over here of this, this thermally, ex, thermally excited upside down CO molecule. And if you look, actually, you'll see that this wave function has some weak amplitude on the wrong side of the potential, right? So that's why these two states tend to get coupled to one another um, by collisions with the phonon. And, and you get these kind of phonons because you have these, you know, you're starting to get weak delocalization of the wave functions at higher energies, and they can match up with the state you're populating thermally. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the complete overview of, of the theoretical predictions of the FGR model. And here's this thermally activated regime, which we see in the experiment. And something that's very uh, interesting and has not been uh, uh, seen uh, experimentally. So, so it's at this point, you know, I just show this to provoke your, your thinking process. Uh, there's, there's also the prediction of this deep tunneling regime down here, which also can show uh, peculiar mass dependence. But, but even in this model, the, you know, basically the, the, the ground state of the upside down CO molecule is still tunneling through this resonance process. It's, it's coupling to some uh, states on the other side of the barrier, uh, which are you know, giving it a, thermal, a, a resonance enhancement. So here's, Here's what those, those states look like. Here's your ground state of your upside down CO. And here's the state in the model that, that it's you know, coupling to a vibrationally excited uh, C down molecule, highly bending excited acceptor state. Now that's kind of interesting for the following reason. Um, if you take this same potential, and, and here's the rate constants that come out of uh, the thermally average rate constants that come out of the FGR model, um, on the same potential, you can do the traditional WKB calculation of the thermal rate constants. And we were really amazed to see that the, the prediction is that this resonance enhanced tunneling is predicted to be, you know, 10 orders of magnitude or more faster than a WKB prediction, right? And that's kind of very thought provoking, right? It's actually very challenging. It challenges the experimentalist and the theoretician. Can you do, well, we can do measurements of, of rates now for these, for these tunneling processes. Can you do a good enough theoretical calculation from first principles that you would trust the absolute magnitude of the tunneling rate to make some comparisons uh, to uh, experiment? And uh, it, it also suggests you know, that when we use in condensed phase, the WKB uh, rate constants for, to describe tunneling, uh, if we use, the, the, you know, this is essentially a gas phase picture, right? You have a barrier and you have a wave that transmits the barrier. Like I showed you at the very first slide, what I knew about tunneling when we first started. The WKB picture has no knowledge of resonance effects, right? And, and this comparison suggests that 
the resonance enhancement of tunneling can be very, very large. And so it just points out that condensed phase tunneling can work very differently than, than gas phase tunneling. And that you need to think of the tunneling as in terms of bound states and not in terms of scattering wave functions. And I'm uh, in particular made us wonder then, does this have possible significance for interstellar chemistry? And in, in, in if you talk to astrochemists, you'll know that uh, many of their mechanisms for how molecules are formed um, in, in, in space is, is inside dark interstellar clouds, which were, you know, there's not a high photon flux, but there's very cold uh, particles, typically silicates that become covered by water, CO, and, and that, for example, the, how you even get H2 in the system is, is pretty much everybody agrees it's H atoms land on these little ice particles that recombine. So they're very important catalytic uh, uh, sites for, for producing interstellar molecules. And, and um, a lot of those chemical reactions uh, that are uh, invoked to explain observations of, of many, many polyatomic molecules that have been seen in the meantime um, involve some tunneling processes. And this, this suggests the basic chemical physics of tunneling, uh, you know, might need to be might need to be revised. So that's bringing me to the end of my talk. I think I, I want to emphasize about condensed phase tunneling that it's fundamentally different than continuum tunneling, gas phase tunneling, because I I would argue you really cannot think of this in terms of a continuum scattering problem, the kind that we learned, you know, in in first year graduate school. For gas phase problems. It resembles much more a state-to-state -state energy transfer process, a molecule with two isomeric structures, uh, which has bound states that cover both wells, um, and collisions induce transitions from one state to another state, and from time to time this is actually a tunneling process. And also there's this uh, probably what's the most interesting, outstanding question uh, to for you know for our, for us in our in our laboratory studies is is to try to see the ground state tunneling um, in in the laboratory and see if it really is much faster than what the WKB tends to suggest. Okay, finally, let me thank uh, the team of scientists that's worked on this. Professor Dirk Schwarzer uh, has been uh, the leader of this project and and a good friend for many years. And Yasha Lau did. Uh, much of the work on the pooling and uh, the, uh, uh, the the discovery of the upside down CO molecule, and Arab Chowdhury and 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 Jesslyn Devine have been uh, working uh, very hard on this on this isotope dependent uh, tunneling processes, and, and so I want to thank them for their efforts. And that's all I want to tell you today. I thank you for your attention. If you like to ask some questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much, Alec. Um, questions, thoughts? Let me just start by saying that I don't know when Alec contacted me, maybe two years ago or something like this, right? You probably don't know this work, right? We did at some point, we had CO on copper 111, and we were measuring how the CO moves from one side to another. We were, we were measuring the diffusion, but in a very strange way. And we saw that it was tunneling. Right, and so that's that's what he said. And then you ask yourself, how does that work? How does a molecule that is a two atomic thing, how does that tunnel? Right? And this is kind of what what Alec was alluding to, right? So you could actually imagine doing some of these experiments also with with the spatial resolution, right? Absolutely. And, and and follow it, right? And of course you have to worry about the impact of the STM tip and so on, right? But it's kind of cool to see that at that time I thought this was easy, right? Well, it's, you know, it's this thing, right? This mass whatever you add the carbon and the oxygen together and you see how that works, but it's not at all that trivial, right? And you see that, that with these high precision spectroscopy uh, kind of things, you can actually learn something that is really surprising. So I find that- I think we were also extremely lucky because I mean, what people normally do, they do the isotope effect, they start with their natural CO and they get some C13016, they measure the isotope effect and then we we were then fortunate that those two were very unexpectedly different, right? Maybe if you had looked at all four isotopes, 
in that study, which I mean, nobody does this, right? Once we saw there was something weird going on, we said, okay, we got to look at all four isotopes. But if you had looked maybe at all four isotopes in that study, maybe you also would have seen that there was some unexpected mass dependence. I would really love to see those studies uh, revisited. Good. So that's just stimulation to think about those kind of experiments. Questions? Ima. So, uh, I mean, what does deep tunneling and kind of curious Deep about? tunneling is kind of a, a, one of those sexy terms that scientists have invented to describe uh, something very trivial, which is basically, you know, what, what you saw here is this gateway tunneling model relies on thermal population of some, you know, vibrationally excited state, which can do something special. And as you lower the temperature, this, these states become less, less and less likely to be populated, eventually you have essentially all the population in the ground vibrational state. And at that point, you can still have tunneling. And that's what people mean by deep tunneling. It loses the temperature dependence. The temperature dependence drops off because you know there, there's no uh, uh, th thermal effect anymore, right? Because you're not changing, pop below some temperature, you're not changing the populations of, of different states anymore. But why they came up with this term deep tunneling, I don't know. I think it's it's because of this deep temperature. It usually sees it in the deepest temperature range of an experiment. Okay, so deep tunneling is essentially like tunneling from the vibrational ground state. That's right. That's a much more precise way to describe it. Yeah. So um, I wonder that you saw the animation showing the sealed molecule is transfer uh, the animation. So I wonder the inverse process can happen. And if yes, uh, is it happen when the vibration uh, relaxation uh, process happen also? It, ac it actually can't happen. Uh, and and that, let me see if I, I can get back to show you something here. Okay, let's just take, let's take, okay, here's the first one, right? So if you see this down here, you have one plus one goes to two plus zero. So you get 24 wave numbers of excess energy, right? Now you can ask the question, how easy is it for zero to two, zero plus two to go back to one plus one? It's possible, right? It's exactly the same uh, coupling to go to the left-hand side, but now you got to come up with 24 wave numbers of, of thermal energy, right? So then you put into your, rate calculation e to the minus 24 wave numbers over kt so it depends on the temperature and because we're at very low temperatures then you know this process might might very well happen with 24 wave numbers but now with 48 wave numbers it's it's e to the minus 2 less likely right and now for 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 the next one here's now uh, you know for, if you ask the question 4 plus 0 goes to 3 plus 1 it's even, there's even less thermal energy available for that to happen. And so what happens is you, you get up, that's why you see in the emission spectrum at about V equals five, that's the first one that's really clearly present in the emission because below that there is some kind of uh, uh, repooling, we call it, right? Or unpooling, right? Happening for the lowest vibrational states. But once you get up to like four or five, it can't go re in reverse anymore. And so it just kind of keeps going up, which is rather, rather, interesting example of how you know entropy is is not driving the system you know it's it's a it's a it's a it's being kinetically driven um so so no it cannot come back down once it gets up above about v equals five or six it simply can't go the opposite direction study uh, carbon monoxide on nacl What's well, that's a good question. So we built this beautiful new spectrometer, right? And we thought, well, uh, there were all these beautiful studies from George Ewing from, from the 80s on CO and sodium chloride and CD and Fred Flores. So, okay, we're going to test the machine. <laughs> we thought everything is known about this. We'll just test the machine. We'll calibrate the machine. And then turned out we saw a lot of new things. So again, it's this idea, build fancy instruments where you can measure things better than have been measured before. You find new things, right? Other questions? Question from the audience. Up to go go ahead. Oh, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful talk. I just have a comment. Uh, uh, in the same slide, 
do you envisage the possibility of uh, stru structuring uh, superconductivity using phonon transfer? We know that some of the phonons, not all phonons, for example, in certain superconductor would be responsible for superconductivity, but we could use the same structure to actually kill superconductivity and structure uh, a lattice on a superconductor. So what do you think that would be interesting uh, uh, to utilize such effect? I'm not sure I understood your question. Are you talking about the nanowires or are you talking about the CO7? No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about the phonon transfer. Uh, since uh, uh, in the same picture as you showed from Monte Carlo simulation, um, uh, since phonon transfer, you could uh, basically structure superconductivity and by uh, basically destroying the superconductivity in certain area using phonon transfer. Would, would, that, would that be a possibility or an application of such effect? So if, if I take, say, a vibrationally excited molecule, and let it interact with the nanowire, yeah, that's right. Or any, or for example, other uh, superconductor. Yeah, that's actually that's uh, that's even been done. So there, there are there is some research done with these nanowires, even to detect ions, for example. Um, that you know, a single ion lands and uh, you know destroys the superconductivity in, in the nanowire and gives a pulse. You can you can use them for molecular detectors and energy detectors, basically anything that carries energy. Uh, can be detected by one of these things. Now it can be a little tricky because, you know, these things are sitting at you know below one kelvin in a vacuum chamber, so they might you know the surfaces are probably covered by something, and so okay. you have to be a little bit careful. You know, like like in our machine, they're certainly covered by molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, possibly some water, and so an infrared photon doesn't cause much trouble. It'll go through that is transparent, um, but you have to think about that. If you came with a molecule to hit that surface, um, you know what what would happen. And I don't, I don't think that's really been looked at all that carefully. But it's, it's a very interesting idea that's crossed through my mind on, on a number of occasions. So, yeah, I think that's that's a, uh, an interesting thing uh, to maybe start a new research program on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm looking at Masi. You always have a question, Masi. Come on, like. I just wanted, like, to because of this isotope effect, you just say it on NSCL, right? So it's only on NSCL that you did it. So and you demonstrate that the mass affects the kinetic, uh, so the kinetic rate. I wonder if you can do the opposite, like choosing different substrates and to see, like, if you can modulate this uh, energy barrier and these kinetic rates with different substrates. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, it's a great idea, and. Um, Lots of things will change, and I mean, you can imagine lots. We haven't done any of this work. Um, this was sort of keeping us busy for quite a while, and uh, I don't know. It's it's always the same in science, you know. You do one nice piece of work, and somebody stands up and says, "Well, why haven't you done these five other studies that are clearly should be done?" And you're right; they clearly should be done, but we we haven't gotten around to them yet. <laughs> Because like it's I, one of the great frustrations of being a scientist. I think you just can't do everything you want to do. But yeah, I mean, you, if, if let's imagine you go to another uh, salt crystal, you will change the lattice spacing, right? So that will make direct predictions about, you know, if the lattice is, is a smaller uh, lattice constant, you'll get stronger dipole-dipole interactions. Perhaps you drive these molecules up to even higher vibrational states. Um, uh, the orientational interactions can be different. I don't know uh, what the upside down CO molecule looks like on lithium fluoride, but these are all sort of really, if you could do science like a like an assembly line mass production factory, you know, these are things you would just be pumping out as fast as you could, you know, because you want to know how, how does that look. But uh, as, it, as you know, things just move much slower than you wish they would. <laughs> they tell me just if my intuition is correct. So if you, if you use uh, a substrate which has has a higher density of state for phonons, yeah. you are so able to transfer much more energy, right? Yeah. So you right. can have more base camps. So you can have. That's right. So like okay. lithium fluoride has a higher Debye frequency. So you'd expect, you know, maybe you get it set up to V equals nine, maybe in the first base camp, maybe you already get to V equals 16 in the first base camp, for example. Okay. Maybe it's, it's if you could design the phonons in such a way, maybe we actually did some experiments where we could clearly see population of the first excited 
triplet state of the CO molecule through these processes, and even some chemistry that would happen between uh, uh, electronically excited CO molecules making things like uh, C3O2 and so forth. These kind of things are possible. You can drive chemistry with this then. Okay, so, thank yeah, you. Th and, and it could, I think your point is very well taken. It could be, you know, sort of optimized or controlled by, you know, varying the phonon structure of the sample. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a good time to end this colloquium. Thank you very much, Alec. And uh, thank you for being on, uh, on Zoom. And uh, we'll see some of you next week. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure.